This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. beat you to it this week you sure did hello what's going on uh you know i'm feeling good spent the day lounging by the pool so i'm nice and crispy rough i have to wear at least spf 70 <laughs> and you bought spf 100 i bought spf 100 which we've read doesn't actually do anything yeah it's kind of placebo or something Some marketing effect <laughs> but i buy it anyway because i am pasty pasty white neutrogena yeah the win. that's my brand that's the only brand that doesn't make me end up crispy but I did not reapply. And I just tan. Yeah, you have the good fortune of simply tanning in the sun. <laughs> Some of us just catch on fire. Crisp. <laughs> so what's going on? Um, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> I was Where... thinking that um the last few months, like there are times when you know that like you're living history. You know, like 9-11 for us was mm-hmm. like one of those moments. Yeah. Sixth grade the class. The last like... Four months have just kind of felt like that on repeat. Not like 9-11, but I mean, just like this general, wow, this is big stuff this is every really happening. single day. This will be in the history books. Yeah. And it's a little heavy. It's more than a little heavy, I think. I was just trying to keep it light. I know. You at the top of the show. <laughs> no, no, we're just going to dive right into heavy stuff. Everything's no, horrible. actually, we're going to have not quite a, as heavy an episode this week. We're going to talk about something a little bit easier we're talking about school calendars and scheduling and how we got the school year that yeah. we got but well, yeah it still actually sort of fits into like the overarching theme of like quarantine because it's like yeah one of the things as educators that we're all like what is what is happening right what's it going to look like everyone's scrambling to kind of re-envision mm-hmm. the school calendar right now because of possibly uh, going back in the fall is going to be either delayed or be remote or be something yeah. different than being what forced we're used to be to a little seeing. less traditional so right right it fits with it sort of but just by yeah. yeah anyways yeah so what are we what are we drinking tonight a lot of water <laughs> a lot of water i'm drinking wine it's that kind of night it's a wine night um, there's probably going to be some faint door scratching from the cat who got locked out this week because last week Chelsea shut her head in the door. I, you're going to get me in trouble and I think with PETA. Um, I, it was a complete accident. I was putting her toy in there and I was closing the door. And as I was closing the door, she happened to stick her head in the door. Can we post that like on Instagram? Like the, a clip? The clip of me slamming the cat's head in the like door? I feel like you're going to get your animals taken away from you. It wasn't on purpose. It was, I mean... <laughs> take my cat away Come it was on completely it was completely it was accidental, an accident and i felt so bad for you her. did she's a sweet thing and, and the cat she... wasn't based <laughs> there's a there's a really horrifying she's very clip. resilient we, we were running we were running the like the mic was hot when we record we were setting up and getting ready for the show and stuff and so the mics were recording when it happened and there's just just thunk there's like a moment of like there's like a breath of silence and then there's a thunk and i'm like (gasps) you're horrified and i'm like oh you're in the background and the cat is like running i felt so bad because she's so sweet but i just was trying to get her stuff out of the way so she wouldn't make noise during the show total accident it's fine she's okay she's i won't tell anyone she's really okay nothing nothing bad happened It sounds worse than it was because I actually I'm I'm throwing something in the closet at this around the same time that her door, it, so you hear a much louder bonk than it was actually her skull, but it sounds like that's her skull. But it was just anyway, it was well, and now you're just incriminating yourself. Uh, I felt so bad. It was totally an accident. She's okay. okay. Everyone's okay. <laughs> Mostly. Ask the cat that. She would have a very different the cat story. Might disagree, but. We've made up for it with lots of snuggles and cuddles uh-huh. and treatos. Uh-huh. Okay. So this week. Yes. All about the school calendar, what it looks like, what it does, what the expectations are, a little bit of history. So here we go. Yeah. Are you going to tell us about the history? Well, that's the thing that I do on this podcast. No, you always, you take it very literally. Well, I have sometimes. to look into the background of the thing we're talking about. And for me, that means rewinding about 1600 years on average. Minimum. Um, but we're not going back that far for this one. Uh, 
Well, actually, I guess we probably are going back that far a little bit at the beginning because school, as we know it, there wasn't always a thing as public education. School and uh, getting an education used to belong to the wealth, wealthy landed class. It used to be a thing that people who could afford it got for their kids. Um, and not that different from today in some ways. I, in some ways, that's not different from today. You're right. But there was no such thing as public education for quite a long while in the history of the world. So education was not a right. It was a privilege. Um, and not everyone had it. So as you can imagine, a school calendar or whatever you want to call it, a schedule of learning for people like that looks a lot different from what a schedule of learning for a public education might look like. So, and I kind of, I found this out in researching this week, but it, it took until, until, let's see, 1918 for every state in the United States to require students to complete elementary school. 19, that blows 18. my mind. It's so recent, and it just seems so recent to me that it, you know, it was not that long ago that we just had a requirement to complete elementary education. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's surprising, but it's kind of not surprising when you think about like people who would be our grandparents' age. Like some of them didn't complete more than like sixth or seventh grade, mm-hmm. and we're mm-hmm. talking about people in their eighties and nineties. So mm-hmm. I mean, I know that's we're over a hundred years. What year was- did you say? Uh, 1918. Yeah, so we're over 100 years, but still, like, our our grandparents would not be so far removed, you and I mean, especially from some of that yeah. type of... I, I was lucky enough to hear stories from my great-grandmother growing up, and mm. she would talk about the one-room schoolhouse experience. Yeah. And if, in any case, there's, you know, there are probably still some living relatives of ours who were... Like three generations. Right, yeah, like we're right. Not, not that long ago mm-hmm. that we just saw the advent of what became the public school system mm-hmm. in America. So, as you can imagine, the, the calendar that comes with that didn't come around until sort of relatively recently, too. A lot of it, I would probably attribute to Horace Mann, if you know that name, um, big education guy. He was the Secretary of Education of Massachusetts in 1837, he was appointed. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just backing it up a little I bit. Know. He led a whole bunch of school reforms that horse man is just one of those names in education that's right like, you know. when you go and get a degree in education you learn this name so it's like horse man 101 yeah their school is named after him and everything but he worked to create a statewide system of professional teachers in massachusetts um and he based it on a prussian model of common schools uh, what, what we call common schools so he uh, initially focused on elementary education and training teachers there but he he kind of led the charge toward compulsory education uh, that spread throughout uh, the Northeast first and then to America. Uh, the American South is probably, I'd say, a decade or two behind the North mm-hmm. on all of these reforms. <laughs> it, well, for example, in 1900, there were 34 states that had compulsory schooling laws, and only four of them were in the South. Yeah. So, um, but there's there data whole, to support that. Yeah, it's not just a whole, sweeping. <laughs> well, there are a whole lot of reasons for claim about the South. <laughs> no, no, I mean. There are a whole lot of reasons for that. I mean, religious schools have something to do with that, but also just mm-hmm. post Civil War era politics have a lot to do with that. Um, I mean, segregation we, have- that we talked about a lot last week, the very sort of end of that era. Anyway, it contributed to the situation in the South being a bit behind the North sure. um, in terms of compulsory schooling laws. So um, back to the cat. Back to the calendar. Slams down her wine. <laughs> Let me say, tell you about calendars. Let me tell you about this calendar. Uh, back to the calendar. So people will often say things like, we have a summer break because of agrarian stuff, farm things. It doesn't really make sense, though, because <laughs> actual farming, the bulk of the work of that happens in spring for the planting and in fall for the harvesting so a very <laughs> a short summer term and a short like you know a summer term and a winter term sure is probably more in line with an agrarian mm-hmm. calendar when mm-hmm. we thought about it, when we think about education but then you got to look at urban schools which at the advent of compulsory education and a little bit before that had a completely different school schedule they were kind of open more or less year round weren't mandatory at first and kids came when they could in in urban cities in urban settings. Just for an example, in 1842, New York City schools were open 248 days a year, which is a lot. No, <laughs> Kate's like no. 
Oh, I cry. Horrible. Okay, so I that's run. way more than 180-ish. 1842. 1842, they were open 248 days a year. But there was more flexibility, and it wasn't compulsory So at that time. Yikes. but um, So you got to consider in the days before air conditioning, schools and cities in general would be miserable in the summer. Mm-hmm. Just absolutely unbearable. That sounds horrible. And yeah, it does. And especially people who could afford it, uh, wealthy and eventually middle class urbanites, they usually get out of the city in the summer. So that's kind of becomes the logical time for to escape the heat. Right. For schools mm. to say, hey, we're not in session. So that's kind of Goodbye. more <laughs> the the idea of the the long summer vacation actually comes more from urban settings than it does an agrarian calendar just because what we said but i mean there's kind of this compromise that comes about through all of that so it sort of has the in its roots both urban and and agrarian kind of getting together to decide that the school calendar should have a kind of longish summer break how that fits into Hmm. Uh, a farming lifestyle i'm not Ahem. exactly sure yeah. but it's we kind of have this you're gonna start talking yeah, about no. daylight savings time now too yeah, no i don't even <laughs> don't even want to get there because <laughs> i it makes me mad daylight savings time it, daylight daylight savings feelings. Feelings. well okay as a software developer yeah because mm. i think of it in terms of a person who has to account for all those weird exceptions and anomalies when i'm programming something anyway <laughs> so now we get, end up at sort of the typical school calendar, at least in the United States. We're going to see that it's more or less the same in many places in Europe. But what, what's, a, what's the school so, calendar look well, like? Well, I think there's going to be like a couple of conversations that kind of happen naturally in this. One of them is going to be like school start and stop time, which is not going to be directly addressed, but it will happen as we probably talk about this. But I think that the hours that are best for learning and teenage development and all that thing like that should be a future episode but that's going to be something that you kind of have to think about when we talk about these things right and you also have to be always factoring in things like um after school activities which is a big reason for a lot of the the calendar scheduling issues so so schools as of 2018 um you would basically see a public school in session anywhere from 160 to 180 days and that's across the united states 2018 like the most recent data yeah that's the most find. recent data i could find that was uh inclusive of all like 50 states in a nice spreadsheet gotcha. so i didn't go looking for every single state but i'm only gonna really be able to speak specifically about ohio because we have started the process since 2017 of converting days in school to make up a school year to hours in the classroom so for Ohio school districts, that includes joint vocational schools, chartered non-public schools, they're all required to have 455 hours for students in half-day kindergarten, 910 hours for students in full-day kindergarten through grade 6, and 1,001 hours for 7 through 12. So you can see that's why you brought up the distinction between days and instructional hours. Right, because, because it used to be you had to hit 180 days in a school year, right. and it was then the school's responsibility to say, okay, this is what our calendar looks like. This is our spring break. This is our, you know, whatever break, but we have to add up to 180. But what has happened because of not even, I mean, obviously we're talking three years ago now, but there's been a push for more flexibility in our schedule um, in the, in public schools at least. And it's sort of kind of an, it feels like a nod to like the understanding that maybe education is changing in some ways that aren't as stereotypical if that makes sense like we should have more flexibility and we should allow kids more opportunities to do things and that's what this shift kind of feels like at times to me it's not perfect but it's a start so there are some pros and cons of ours and this is based on i guess it's my opinion obviously as i've seen schools transition through this but i think that there are also some logistical things that just need to be addressed as part of this in ohio especially we have we can have a lot of snow days and so i see ours helping with that situation because what happened my first few years as as a teacher was that we would have maybe like 14 or 15 snow days and we would add on the bulk of the time after testing and it's like well it's nice that we're doing this but like what are we really doing by adding on time at the end once the state mandated testing has already been fulfilled? So that kind of feels like a weird thing to me sometimes. So you plan in excess of your required number of instructional hours by however many? Um, we, my district hasn't made the switch from days to hours. Oh. So and it's a contract thing. 
most teachers' teach. contracts uh-huh. are by a set amount of days, uh-huh. not by hours. Does that make sense? Yeah. So teachers are completing days of their contract. So that's what makes up our school year, right? But we're not, we're in total excess of 1,001 days or hours, I'm sorry. Okay, so Ohio has said we require 1,001 instructional Minimum. hours. Minimum. Minimum, right. So but for schools your district who have... is like, well, we're going to get that in, but we're going to do it by means of this number right. of days right. in our school year. Okay. And so some schools have completely switched over to this is exactly how many hours we need to be here mm-hmm. and this is how mm-hmm. we function. Other schools are doing it more like mine, which is like we're fulfilling the hours, but by counting the days essentially. So those are the good things I think about counting hours. I think it allows, especially now that we've seen this stupid quarantine like, we are maybe in a place where we say, hey, like, we kind of have to reevaluate this to say, what does learning look like in a year where something like this happens? And what can we guarantee? I mean, I think the whole thing is a little bit weird because how can you really, I mean, when you think of like a thousand and one hours, that's a very abstract, it doesn't translate exactly in my mind into an easy, like, ah, yes, this is what we've learned this year. It's more just yeah. sort of like an abstract estimate of the number of have hours their, have their butt in a seat for this right long. and it doesn't to me it's a little bit archaic in a way to think of learning that way in terms of a number of hours it is and i and i yeah i mean i guess if that's your approach it can be but i guess on my end i see it as something more forgiving mm-hmm. than what like this day right. thing sometimes requires like my first year of schooling i wish i w- had actually written it down to remember we had at least 15 snow days mm-hmm. and we haven't had that many since then right but my right. very first year of teaching we made up 15 days i think that yeah. the hours can help in these kinds of circumstances it, like so for a year if you have a blizzard right and you're out 10 days like yeah. that doesn't ultimately mean you have to add you know X amount of days I, at the end. Sure. That's I, where I I'm do, coming from. No, no. And I think that what I was going to say is like, it does, it, the intent of it back to even Horace Mann, and it's like saying, this is compulsory. We're going to try to make available to every student at least the same level mm-hmm. of education. It's kind of like what we were talking about with Common Core stuff. It was yeah. that same kind of, and again, from the common school, um, a Prussian common school idea. It's like, everybody gets this baseline opportunity. We're guaranteeing And this. I think that that's kind of what the spirit of the baseline number of instructional hours per year Mm -hmm. is about. However, like you're saying, there can be kind of more and less flexibility around that. And some people do. I mean, at least I am a person who questions whether that metric, even though I I totally understand what it's trying to do is give everyone an equal opportunity to learn. Sure. What it does in practice is maybe not translated all to what actual learning is happening. It's like, yeah, like you were saying, it's like butt in seat hours and not mm-hmm. really necessarily mm-hmm. learning hours that we're counting there. Yeah. We have to just kind of be a little more explicit about what we're actually well, talking and about. I should say that like when you consider our school or a school who is following by hours, like lunchtime doesn't count. So like those things do get, you know, like as part of the bundle of like what is, you know, how many hours are in a school day, like those types of things aren't included normally. Uh-huh. So the cons of it, though, this is, and this is just based on what I've heard from other districts, like people in other districts, is that it can really damage and be painful for, like, janitors and cooks and bus drivers, because that would mean that they're doing maybe less than a normal 180-day year. So it would be a pay cut for some people. Mm -hmm. Now, on the reverse side of things, that could be a pro for schools, because that might mean that we're saving money by being open fewer days of the year. You know, so, like... There's, like, give and take, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I, that's, like, one of the biggest things that I hear about as a as a negative for the hours is that, like, people with these jobs are, you know, expecting X amount of days and that this could then cut into that. Yeah, that's a hard one for me mm-hmm. because in my mind, if it's contributing to a better education for students, that is what should be done regardless, unfortunately, regardless of how it's going to impact some mm-hmm. of these other kinds of jobs that are associated with running a school district, it has to be the thing. No, that and, you I, and I agree with you. But it's for just, administrators, that's yeah. a definitely a delicate dance. Mm-hmm. Like, I can totally understand. And I Well, because you want to value them because they're important. Right. Absolutely. I mean, our schools don't work without these people. No, absolutely. They so are important. You don't want to. I don't want to be the one doing that yeah. dance as an administrator, administrator for sure. But, mm-hmm. the, but I do think if it comes down to 
you know, the choice between helping students and keeping all of these job opportunities available, I'm going to probably choose the helping students route. But I mean, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think that's the right move, but it doesn't make it an easy move. No, not at all. But also, hey, maybe we should stop defunding education. Okay. Anyways, so <laughs> ours calculation is really common, like I said, but this also is really tricky because... Schools have to work with unions and administration and things like that to create what this looks like. And so for every single school, even a public school in a state, it's going to look differently. And so that's kind of where, you know, like when I talk to my other friends who are teachers in other places, it's always kind of interesting to hear like, okay, so how did it go for you and what's it look like? And so even for, you know, a state like us with a thousand and one hours, it looks different from public school to public school, even though we're all kind of doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. So my school, I calculated it, and it's basically 1,215 hours that we're actually in, which is higher than any of the states that I found. And by the calculation, we're basically 30 days in excess of the minimum. Now, you don't want to just get the minimum. It's not like whatever, <laughs> I don't know, April... 28th that we hit a thousand one everybody walks out and we call it a year you know like mm-hmm. that's not what it is but it does show us that there is some room to work with and so a lot of the arguments about this though are <laughs> we hear these all the time but it's people in communities being like well my tax dollars and they should be there and i'm paying for you know so that's kind of where we see um, wait wait, wait. The, the argument is my tax dollars are paying for they should be in school but in seat instructional hours and that the teacher should be there and that um if they get out of school too early or if they're yeah so like you know if schools maybe get out before memorial day oh well back in my day we used to whatever we hear a lot of that type of thing like these are just a few of the problems that surround this like obviously i'm kind of you know basing this all on my limited exposure and where i work and the people in the community that I've heard talk about these things. But it does make it hard for administration and teachers and unions, if they have one, to strike a perfect balance of what a school year looks like. So I don't I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what a perfect school year looks like. But all of these kind of lead up to the questions of like, okay, if you miss days before testing, why make them up after testing? And What do teacher salaries and schedules look like if we're basing it on hours and not days? And how do our unions fight? You know, like there's just, it's like a really like delicate thing all the way, turtles all the way down, you know, it just goes on forever. So I think the other thing that a lot of people probably aren't really considering about hours and days, especially in the case of makeup school days post state test is like, one of the biggest hits on our school report cards by state is attendance. So if we're making up days, you know, in May, especially after Memorial Day or something like that, that's going to be a factor in how we're rated. And many of our families are already planning trips and vacations and things like that. So I think that's one thing that schools have to think about as well when we're talking about what does it look like if we're making up these hours or days or however they're factoring it is like, how is it going to also affect us in these other ways, which is more than just butts in the seats time, but also all of these big things that we care about, which is like state report card, which is a horrible thing anyways. Yeah. I, being the non-classroom teacher who likes to dream big, get really frustrated by all of that conversation because... Is even, that why you just let me go on and ramble forever well, just now? <laughs> no, no. And like, again, from the perspective of like somebody who actually works in a school or a school administrator, all of those considerations totally make sense. To me, it obscures the real question. And that's like, what is best for how a kid learns? Yep. Like maybe at what, let's see, you start at like seven, what time does your day start? Um, 733 is the first bell. 733 to like 232. 232. Okay. So you want some really horrible to numbers to work with? Yeah. <laughs> So your your days are maybe a seven thirty to two thirty five days a week schedule, really has no relation to how well kids learn whatsoever. Yeah. And there are plenty of studies like you were talking about. We'll probably talk about the hours in a school day at some other mm-hmm. session. How kids, how and when kids best learn, whether that kind of timing makes sense and how it weighs into extracurriculars and stuff like that. But again, maybe it it just all seems so abstract, and to me. 
disconnected from mm-hmm. how learning actually happens to talk about learning in terms of quantities of hours of yeah. instruction. It really does seem, and, and all these considerations, again, they're things, they're really difficult questions that school administrators especially have to deal with and make decisions about, but it just seems to me to be missing some of the points, which is just like, it feels that way. What is best for helping kids learn well and i don't even know like what the perfect school year would look like like i don't know what the best case scenario is i know of a school who does a four-day class week and on fridays teacher work teachers work half days and i like that idea because that could give you some time on fridays to like work with kids and do some uh, development and things like that that would be built into your week to make it more dynamic, I think. And so I like that idea. But honestly, like for Ohio, it just really, I mean, it depends on your location. That's the bottom line. In Ohio, it can be really hot in August. And so many think that we should start after Labor Day. I am blessed to work in a building that's air conditioning, there that has air conditioning. One of my closest and best teacher friends works in an elementary that does not have air conditioning. So... We would probably have very different opinions on when a good start and stop date is. That's a big problem in Baltimore City schools. A lot of the schools aren't air conditioned. Yeah, so, I mean, we're talking about kids being, you know, that's not a great learning environment. And so, but days like that can be, like, that's one of the perks of an hour schedule. So if you do have a day where the water goes out, which is something that occasionally happens (laughs) in the town where I work, like, some days we, you know, like, we've lost power before. Like, Mm -hmm. all of those things are great factors to be considerate of when thinking, like, okay, this day might not have been our best day. (laughs) Yeah. So for us in Ohio, though, I would say most schools start usually back the third week of August, and we're usually done the last week of May, sometime close to Memorial Day. It's consistent for Ohio, at least in a general sense. But the other thing that we have to think about, which I think is funny because the part that I work in is pretty rural, we have to worry about like county fairs and like kids missing for fair and stuff like that. So there are schools that I know of that have to take off a week, three weeks into the school year because their attendance is so low because the involvement at the county fair is so Mm -hmm. high that so that like those are the weird things that happen. First day of deer gun season. Yeah, we have that day off. Yeah. It's built in as a day off because yeah. we know our attendance would be horrible. I told that to some of my coworkers in Baltimore, and mm-hmm. they looked at me just completely baffled. Yeah, deer like, day. You take off a day of school for hunting deer. the Monday deer. after Thanksgiving. Like, yeah, we sure do. Yeah. But, like, those days, right? Like, those are things that are maybe unique <laughs> to Ohio. Mm-hmm. Or, other, or to a region. Or to yeah, exactly. Or, you know. Yeah, and, like, the county fairs are important to these kids because they sell their animals. Like, whatever. So those are like weird little things. They sell their what? Th- they sell their animals. Okay. What do you think I was gonna sell? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> they sell their sibling. No. Uh, I don't think everybody. Uh, I don't know that all. Or of they our show listeners, them. Sure. I'm just saying. I'm not sure all our listeners are necessarily super familiar with that yeah. process. Um, but it is one. A lot of my one. students. This is the most like ca- like cows are the, usually the most popular things to be shown and sold lambs too i have a lot of students who do goats i've had students like make bank on selling their yeah steers so, so there anyways are, there are livestock auctions yes. at the county fairs and that's that's that an important part to. for our families right? right that's their livelihood for some of them and so they're going to miss school because this is something that they need like they need money to run the farm like so there are schools around us that have to miss an entire week of school because that's the county fair week and that's when they can make their money anyways all of these things, right, get thrown under the umbrella of maybe the hours is a good idea. Yeah, so, so there there are definitely some regional eccentricities, but on the whole, the United States is pretty much agreed. I know there are some schools, and again, you can kind of decide this on a district basis as long as you're in line with your state's mandated instructional hours, but there are some schools, even in the states, that have like a year-round schedule, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but you can definitely be flexible within that basic you know minimum all in all in the united states pretty consistent Mm -hmm. pretty consistent with european models too it is it's actually more um similar than i thought it was going to be and i was i was kind of surprised to see how close actually these things are are kind of connected so they basically start and stop at the same time they usually start between august and september so that's consistent as us 
the earliest it will start is in places like Denmark and Finland, and that will be in early August. So it's it's really not that far off from what we do here. So, but the number of school days vary. So I never saw anywhere where it said that they were, they're doing days, it seems. Like I have never saw a conversion to hours for them, but it's mm-hmm. anywhere between like 170 and 200 days. Mm-hmm. So it's right on the mark with what we were seeing as well. So they're not an extreme amount longer, you know, whatever. It's consistent. Really, it's not that different from us. And I think in my head, I've always thought that the European thing, like look, like their school system looks so different just in general, but it's really not that far off. So it seems that if you compare what the U.S. is doing, educational like time, right, hours or days, we're on the mark to be competitive with what Europe is doing Mm -hmm. time-wise. So it it feels like even though 1001 was like a weird number, like it's not inconsistent with what's happening. Some of the numbers that come out of some of those European countries might indicate that... (laughs) hours doesn't have much to do with how well you learn if sure we're, if we're on the same you know same level of instructional hours in some of these countries that far outpace us in some of these testing standards then might lead one to believe that it's not the number of hours that really makes a difference mm-hmm. in the proficiency right for these students but there you have it i just wanted to make the connection i suppose that our days and our hours, however we've converted them, is consistent with that of Europe, which is a school system that I think that we should be considering, you mm-hmm. know what I mean, as we're planning and prepping. So mm-hmm. that was really my point with that. Yeah. So, so what else? Yeah. What are just some, in general, a couple of problems with a typical school calendar as we know it? Mm-hmm. There's a big one known as a summer slide or other things when you come back from summer vacation, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, do you notice that in your kids? I get new kids every year Uh and I have mostly 10th graders. So I just blame it on the fact that they're freshmen. (laughs) I see. see. But I don't know. I, I really value the summer for my students. So I would have a hard time, I think, giving up that complete idea because I have so many students who work and do take college classes you know like Mm -hmm. who I mean, not all of them are obviously doing what they should be doing, but I, I needed the summer. And I still yeah. need a summer. Yeah. And I think it's really important to be able to give yourself some time. I think teachers really do need an opportunity to rest and recharge in one form or another. I do think... So there are some problems with the summer slide. There are... Uh, it shows up in a reading mm-hmm. a lot. No, and I know it does. Math too. Yeah. So there, there are general... Uh, sort of across the board, what I was looking at some statistics for this, there are across the board losses for mathematics when you come back you're kind of at a disadvantage from having forgotten stuff over the summer and that's across the board mathematics but in the reading the realm of reading often more affluent families the students in those families do not have as much of a uh, of a deficit when they come back as as Mm -hmm. others poor students do so you know, the less wealthy students are at a disadvantage um, in reading in one million games ways over the summer. Yeah, <laughs> yes. but it's, it's just we, yeah another way that we see some of these, you know, class-based disparities and showing up in education. Yeah, so that, that summer slide can disproportionately affect some students more yeah. than others, but it is, it is a real documented phenomenon. And we talk about, like, the influence of some kinds of extracurriculars on the school calendar, too, because mm-hmm. some of these kids who factor. are in sports or music programs um a lot of times they need to be pulled out of the classroom to go do those things that they're doing Mm -hmm. just because of whatever reason it has to happen during instructional hours um so again i think maybe a little more flexibility around the concept of a baseline for learning that is not quite so rigid and like numbers Mm -hmm. of hours and days and stuff might open up all kinds of educational opportunities but until we're at that point it is kind of a hassle for teachers to have to try it's a lot of work when kids take a week off yeah so what are some of the alternative models that you've seen that you know about and maybe just kind of like if you can envision the future like the perfect future for education what would it look like i i think that and i think we're gonna see this with coronavirus i think we're maybe going to see more intentional uses of time out of school but as online learning Mm -hmm. i think we might see maybe the first week after uh we're supposed to be back from christmas break that first week could be online you know those types of things i think there's a chance for that and this is only kind of talking about the quarantine right now but i think that if we can sort of like 
get better at this aspect of learning, then there's a chance that that could be more easily integrated into future years. And, you know, if even if we have the, the ability to say, oh, January or February look like they're going to be, you know, a lot of bad storms or something like that. Like maybe we could start to prep for things like, okay, we're going to take the next two weeks off and it's going to be online learning. Like I think that that could be exciting. I don't think it's going to be perfect, but I think that there's hope that we can build some sort of calendar that maybe would allow, you and I mean, for some more, um, what do I want to say? Like an easier sort of transition in and out of that, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a hope of mine, I suppose, especially for quarantine. Like I'm just thinking if... If we have the waves, you know, return like they're predicting them, yeah, we're gonna have to get creative. I I do for sure think that people are starting to talk about the influence of technology on the school calendar and mm-hmm. how we might see more of distributed, you know, yeah. remote learning opportunities happening, and maybe I think it's important too. Yeah, I mean, and maybe kids don't need to spend the whole school day in the school. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, maybe they come for a couple hours and then mm-hmm. head out, or yeah, you know, do whatever it is. Um. I, have you are you familiar with this year-round calendar with like two or three oh, week breaks God. once a season? I think in practice it might be nice because you wouldn't have that big slide like you were talking about. Yeah. But I would rather have my one big summer with yeah, my Yeah, most pool. of the teachers I talk to want <laughs> one big summer. <laughs> Although I do defer to teachers on this is that like for the same reason I think sabbaticals are important. I think big long breaks are important to rest and recharge for teachers because it's just such an intense job and it's constant and you're mm-hmm. never out of it and mm-hmm. your work day extends far beyond. I mean, I just finished my yearbook bell. yesterday. Right. So you're still working on started. And you're still working on your high school yearbook this far into the summer. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's just, there are all these kinds of things like the, the amount of hours a teacher spends working outside of the classroom. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, and people don't see that behind the scenes stuff when they think about yeah. their kid's teacher. They just think about the teacher being there from 7.30 to 2.30 at the end and they don't think about them showing up to see I the think, concerts and the athletic events yeah. and like all the stuff that teachers do and like the after school help with kids who need it and just all kinds of things that a long period of resting and recharging I think is really important for i don't think two or three weeks is enough two or three weeks uh once per season so four times a year you would have a two or three week break i mean i understand i don't know that's tough it feels less like a recharging period for me and more like a, a nap. brief pause <laughs> yeah a nap <laughs> i think i would get burnout with that i feel right. like i would never feel like i was getting anywhere Mm-hmm. and like would one of those breaks just mean that it was a new school year when you came back like that's mm-hmm. one of my questions like that mm-hmm. would it would just be so weird because there's so much prep that goes into a new school year like like i'm already yeah. doing stuff to start getting ready right. for next school year right. so and i've got you know a yeah. month and a half so i think I that one is mostly about combating summer slide but there are other yeah. ways to combat summer slide yeah. that don't necessarily look like that um especially with what we're talking about with like online classes and- i also the only thing that i would have a hard time another thing i would have a hard time with is like these schools that are air conditioned oh mm-hmm. my gosh mm-hmm. i don't know how you could be in school in july yeah that'd be pretty miserable i mean unless your two or three week break was august but then you'd still be there for part of i don't know it'd be hard to do that part mm-hmm. i think that's mm-hmm. one of the blessings of our long break is that a lot of the heat, you know, we've already kind of gotten through. And I just, I like I said, I have an air-conditioned room. I'm okay, but not everyone is that fortunate. Yeah. <sighs> All right. So much unknown. Yeah. And it's, I think we're going to be finding out very quickly what these schools are going to be doing in the fall. And it's, it's going to be, I don't know. I think we're going to see a lot of options Mm -hmm. popping up Mm -hmm. and I think it's going to feel very unfair for some people and I think it's going to seem privileged to you know I think there's just there's a lot to figure out and I don't know what the answers are but I I think that the hours for a school year could be beneficial if used as intended and I think that there is some room especially if we're worried about quarantine to use that to our advantage and to help make sure that we're doing the most and, you know, taking care of our kids. Mm-hmm. But I don't know what's right, man. That's hard. Where are you on that? I really am not qualified to have a very strong opinion other than that I still maintain that, like, the sort of weird abstract notion of hours equaling learning is one that I kind of chafe at. I don't... <laughs> I, I chafe. Just, 
Well, and again, and I'm not a huge proponent of the way standardized testing works in schools mm. either, but I do think that like saying this is how, I don't know. I, I guess I just don't like using the hour as the measuring stick. for. So a day is better to you? No, no. I'm saying hours or days. I'm not, I'm saying time is not. <laughs> you want moons? What do you want? <laughs> no, I'm saying time. I'm saying time at all is not a good measure okay. of learning. We but then use... how do we, <laughs> what do we use? Right. I mean, you use. Uh... The learning itself? Yes. Yes. That, that. So if a kid, okay. So it's more about the growth than it is about the time it takes to do it. Absolutely. But again, like okay. I was saying, I, I totally understand how we have to have kind of some basic agreement that everybody should at least get this much, yeah. which is what that whole what was that whole push was for. But I think it's becoming a little too rigid now in that we're like, oh, we have to have 42 minute periods or 53 minute periods mm-hmm. or however many because that yeah. is I need seven more minutes in the day to talk to my kids. And it's just like, OK, Real. well, I mean. Maybe something's a little bit wrong if we're looking at learning happening in terms of minute intervals. It's just, I think, to me, it just seems a little counter to how I would want to measure gains over the course of an academic year. I don't, I don't want to do it in hours. I agree with that, but you have to have, I mean, you have to have a plan. You have to have a schedule. I have yeah. to be able to say, this is what's got to happen this period, yeah. and this is the kind of time I know it requires. Right, right. So, I mean, right, there are practical concerns and and. And in the interest of fairness, it seems to make sense to say, well, everybody has to get at least this much time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think that even like there are tons of studies that say things like smaller class sizes are what really improve the quality of instruction. So, I mean, you could shorten a school day even by a ton or maybe shorten your school year. But if you decreased your class size, you might actually increase learning gains during the same same amount of time or less time or whatever it we is. We have to stop defunding education in yep. order for that to happen. We really do have to stop defunding <laughs> education. Okay. Any last thoughts? No, I mean, I, I I think that probably about sums it up for me. It's just that the the passage of time as a measuring stick for learning is a little bit convoluted to me, but I understand mm-hmm. why we feel like we have to have a baseline. So. Yeah. I, I think there's... Obviously, it can always be better, but I think that the hope of ours is to allow districts of all kinds to find what best suits them in ways that are maybe less strict than days, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think more and I think that's important is better. Yeah, I do too. So, and I think that's the hope. I think that's the goal. Looking forward to seeing what the future brings there. Yeah, we'll see. All right. Can you remind us? We're going to move on to our fill in the blank segment. Can you remind us what uh, last week's fill in the blank question was? Last week, the question was, uh, in the 1960s, a sociologist coined the term redlining to describe the discriminatory practice of fencing off areas where banks would avoid investments based on community demographics. What was the name of that sociologist? It was John McKnight. John McKnight. Yep, that was him. Okay, so this week... Yeah. To go with our theme. We're asking about calendars. Go right ahead. The Gregorian calendar is the one that we know that's most commonly used. It's what gives us the 365 days in a year, allows for a leap year every four years. So the Gregorian calendar was named for blank. The man who introduced it in October of 1582. I took it back even further this week than you did, history-wise. You sure did. You I went, beat you by about 300 and some years. You went back really far. You're welcome. Are we ready to move on to what we learned? You want me to go first? Yeah, I'd love for you to okay. go first. Okay, mine's kind of long. Sorry. So last week, there was a celebration of Juneteenth. I was never taught about, you know, anything about this in high school or in college. I have to admit that. And so I've been working to learn and unlearn a lot of things right now to try to be, you know, uh, as good of an ally as I can be. And so Juneteenth was uh, originated in Texas on June 19th, 1865. And so to put it simply, it was a day to celebrate the emancipation of enslaved people. So, But specifically, it commer- commemorates the Union Army General Gordon Granger announcing federal orders in Galveston, Texas, that proclaimed that all the slaves in Texas were free. And so the Emancipation, emancipation Proclamation had been more than two years prior. Ease. But because Texas was so remote to the Union... It hadn't really happened in the way that it was supposed to be as far as um, freeing these enslaved people. And so he went there to tell them, essentially, because there were so many of them that didn't know that they were free for the last two plus years. Wow. 
And so um, these stories are really important to tell and share. And it's a day that um, has been celebrated in Galveston and, and by many black communities. And so it's it's finally kind of getting the airtime that it deserves. And I had to be honest, I didn't really know about it. And so I learned about that. And the other thing, this is important to me because I'm an English teacher and I've learned something this week that I feel like I should share, but I am uh, trying to cut the word savage out of my personal use and I do use it, not a lot, but I've definitely been like, oh, that was savage, you know, like a remark or something like that. But it is a word that actually has deep roots um, based on the inhumane treatment of indigenous people by the colonizers. And so the colonizers would call them savages and it was one of the things basically that they basically used to make them less than human and, and to support their genocide, essentially. So we should all try to get rid of the word savages. I know that you know of a lot of words that go into that category. That <laughs> I should do one every week. <laughs> you're often, yeah, you're often pointing them out to me because I use words that have really... Well, we all do. Crazy, no. cranky background stories. It's like you can't be gypped. You don't yeah, say gypped That's it's the based one on I think the gypsies. Of, right. You mm-hmm. don't want to say gypped. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know my uh, view of language is that it evolves sometimes but that we probably should be aware of the deep roots of these things and try yeah. try to make sure that we're not well and I also I understand I I hear that a lot online and I and I love that about language but I just feel like as an educator um, it's the same reason why I don't let my students use the word retarded it's the same reason I don't let my students use the word gay as a stand in for something as stupid or dumb you know like and so I just feel like If I am modeling this with my vocabulary, then at least I'm, you know, Mm -hmm. doing my little part. It's not going to save the world, but it's going to at least make me feel like I'm not, you know, contributing. What'd you learn? (laughs) Ha I... (laughs) Your favorite thing right now. Yeah. I've often talked about local public libraries because they're one of my favorite things. They're centers of learning. Big fan. (laughs) They're just, you know, I just wish that we could have a huge revolution and take like a lot of the money that is being spent on all kinds of other crazy bad things. Militarizing the police. Well, you know, maybe we could take money spent on essentially oppressing. So like wars and excessive policing and all kinds of that stuff like that and maybe apply it to things that would prevent the necessity of those things in the first place, like education Mm -hmm. and basic improvements of living living conditions for people all over the world so anyway i'm a big fan of things that you know institutions that are doing that kind of you love a good library i love me a good local public library but this week i learned that ours that we just uh got a card for finally we got uh (laughs) took us a while (laughs) <laughs> it, they uh but anyway the local public library here i was reading we're getting ready to do a bit of a road trip so i was trying to download some ebooks and some audiobooks from the library system which you can do you just download an app on your phone you can check books out but digitally they're ebooks so i can get them on my kindle and we can just check books out that way so it's cool really, it's really cool um but i found out this week that this library system lends out ukuleles no first of all no i know you don't like ukuleles no we don't need to we don't need one it's okay but no. they also lend out sewing machines that's cool um just like all kinds of cool like Gosh, weird random stuff they, that they need so much out. more money yeah they they but uh, another thing that i learned was available through library system that i didn't even realize i had a subscription to this thing it's a website called linda linda.com it's actually called linkedin learning now because linkedin bought it which is kind of sad in my mind but anyway it's a really great video learning like video course uh, stuff for like a lot of like technology and things like that you can go and watch a video course on how to use like you know an adobe software program or how to code a you know web application or whatever it is so it's a lot of stuff that i used to get started in my line of work back in the day but i had a subscription to it through my graduate school and it lasted after I graduated but uh, they recently you know decided not to renew the contract so I didn't have it for a while and I've been kind of bummed about that because I just like to learn new things every once in a while and Linda was great for that but I found out that the local library has subscriptions you can you can do subscriptions to that learning resource through the lab through your library card number so I was excited to learn about that support them yeah, support your local public libraries. They're not just 
containers for books. They are. But that's one of their perks. They are. It is one of their perks. <laughs> they are centers of learning for your community and, and they provide learning opportunities that you probably don't even know about and never would have expected their community centers. They're places where seniors participate in activities mm-hmm. together. They do, you know, uh, early childhood they education. They resume. They do I reading mean, they do books. all kinds they of things. Yeah. Do, they're stand-ins for daycares for some people because mm-hmm. they, you know, send their kids to activities to the library. So yeah. they're great resources. If your community doesn't have one, you probably have a community nearby that does. Um, just check it oh out gosh. and always support your local public library. My systems. parents used to take me all the time oh yeah one of my favorite things when i was little oh yeah going to the library was a big event in my childhood and Mm -hmm. doing stuff there during the summers was a big thing and checking out books i was always spending time in a couple of different sections of the library like i was looking for redwall books and like before that when i was wee little berenstain berenstain bears was a big one Mm. yeah yeah and the bookmobile my favorite bookmobile very important anyway local public library system we're learning all kinds of weird crazy things that they lend out so check it out support them yep yep anything else this week Uh, i think that's a wrap we'll see you next time see ya bye Listeners, thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Whoop, whoop, there it ain't.